Yo, what's going on, Epic7? I'm Sue, and it's that time of year again. Time to choose a Moonlight 5-star of your choosing with the Headhunt Recruitment event. I wanted to wait a couple of days before I made a tier list with my recommendations on what the best ones are for new and veteran players. Because, well, we just had arguably the biggest balance patch in Epic 7 history. And I kind of wanted to see where things settled rather than just kind of, you know, throw it out there on the first day that the event was actually available. This list is primarily geared towards PvP, but I will mention some PvE use cases. So if a character is lower or higher than you expect them to be, it's probably because, again, it is more PvP focused. At the end of the day, no matter how I rank them, it's just my opinion. And if you have a character in mind that you really want to take, I encourage you to do so because, well, Epic 7 is a game played for fun. And if a character that I have rated as kind of low tier or just not really recommended is the character you actually want, then you should just take it. This video will be pretty long. So as always, use the timestamps down below to kind of jump to whichever character that you want. I'll spend about 30 to 60 seconds per character explaining why they're there. And above my head somewhere, I'll probably post some example stats and builds that that way you could kind of build the character and get an idea of can you actually build the character. Nothing would suck more than wanting to take a character like C Fan and Paladis, and then the example build I have above my head is something you can't actually even build. So make sure you can actually build the character before you take it. All right, with all that out of the way, let's explain the tiers first and foremost. So the top tier here is must haves every single account, regardless of playstyle can benefit from these characters that are in this tier. Incredibly important are the next most important characters. You should also have all of these characters on your account if you are serious about playing PvP. Commonly used are good characters that could be used in a lot of scenarios, but they might not be as broken or as impactful as the characters above them. Sometimes used are just largely counterpick characters or they require a lot of setup to do their job. One Trick Pony are characters that only have one really oddly specific thing that they are good at in the current state of the game and aside from that there's not really much of a reason to take them impossible to gear cleave units is exactly what it sounds like these are characters that are actually usable but you're gonna need like actually crazy good gear that most people watching this video don't have and even if you do have that gear most of the time it is better to take all that gear and put it on a character like ran hera or sea phantom Politus. I can't recommend our characters I'm not going to even talk about here in the video because, well, they're not particularly very good. You may notice that Twisted Idol on K-Run is in there despite having a buff. That should sort of speak to how I feel about him post-buff. Oh, right. Before I jump into the must-haves tier, I also have to mention that characters in the same tier, unless I mention otherwise, are roughly similar in terms of power level. I just alphabetized the characters, which is why they are displayed this way. Anyways... Let's jump into the very first character in the must-haves tier, which is Ambitious Tywin. Hands down, the best knight in Epic 7. Highest win rate hero at Worlds by a pretty sizable margin. He had like 80 or 82% win rate or something like that. And the next closest character was like 60 or 62%. So, yeah. But far and away the highest win rate character at Worlds. He's amazing for all playstyles, whether you like to play fast and aggressive or slow and reactive. He's excellent for both ends of the spectrum. All three moves in his kit are really good regardless of matchup. His basic attack skill, Icy Storm Sword, drains souls from the opponent. Passive skill, Battle Command, helps cleanse debuffs and also increases his speed and damage. And of course, the moneymaker is his skill 3 Flash, which stuns and defense breaks the entire enemy team. And it can ignore effect resistance. And you can soul burn it so you can keep spamming it over and over again. It just takes all the momentum away from your opponent and translates to some very easy wins character is just ridiculous and that's before we talk about the fact that he's reasonably tanky has good speed right and he can hold most of the good knight artifacts in the game to some success Arius, Spashion, and Pelusha, just to name a few character is just amazing if you're looking for a knight or a tank or just a good utility character ambitious tywin is a character you cannot go wrong with next up is death dealer ray who is very similar to ambitious tywin character just is absolutely insane his skill 3, Cloud of Death, is just a broken move, just like Ambitious Tywin's Flash. It just gives you all of the momentum in a game when you use it. It gets rid of your opponent's buffs and puts everybody to sleep, which allows you to easily, systematically dismantle the entire enemy team, right? Amazing for all playstyles. He can anchor for your cleave draft. 
He can be an initiator for your aggressive teams, and he can also be an amazing come from behind character. The character also has very few reliable counters as I'm recording this video. The characters that are decent counters to him, the Death Dealer Ray can just play around it by sequencing differently. Like against Selene, he can just use his uh, basic attack skill to sleep characters until you actually get rid of Selene. And then he just is unchained, wins the game from there. Same thing with Dragon King Sharoon. You can just use his S2, zero push your team, get bonus damage from Pestilence, pick off the Dragon King Sharoon, and then again, he's unchained. And then you get to just kind of do the thing, Cloud of Death, win the game. Until they buff existing characters or release new characters that are actual, honest to goodness, hard counters to this character, I don't see Death Deal Array moving from the top of the mountain. It might take three months, it might take six months, it might take a year. I don't know how long it's going to take, but at least for the next like month or two, this character is probably still going to stay on top. If you're a new player, by the way, this character is free from the Fallen Land Selector in the Moonlight Theater. So if you didn't know, you can pick them up for free there. Next up, the final character in this tier is C Phantom Politis. She is an incredibly powerful opener. She strips opponents' buffs, slows the entire enemy team, and also speeds up your entire team with Enrage. Enrage makes her broken with teammates like Genua and Ambitious Tyon, by the way, because those characters get bonus effects when they're Enrage. Ambitious Tyon gets that ignore effect resistance on his flash. Ridiculous. On top of that, her passive completely shuts down certain characters like Sylvan Sage Vivian, thanks to, you know, reducing fighting spirit and focus in her passive. They had to completely change Lionheart Sermia in the last, like, month or two, just so that that way she wouldn't get completely screwed by this character's passive. Very powerful passive. She also starts in stealth and stays in stealth, so other openers like Zeo can't really interact with her, and that's just really, really powerful. On top of that, Guaranteed dual attack with your highest attack hero, which lets her be a duplicate copy of your best DPS. If you're new and you've been watching along with my Abyss series, you know how powerful using Adventurer Raz is with Commander Lorena. Think of that in a PvP setting. That's essentially what you have there. A character that does it all and gets that effect for free and your opponent can't really interact with it. Characters just nuts. I will say she is better suited to aggressive players than slow players, but... Even then, if you're a slow player, she's still good on like arena offense and guild war offense. You might not want to venture into world arena with her, but even me, who's a turtle, I still play the character to large success in those uh, player versus player matchups where it's like against the AI, like arena and guild wars. Again, no matter which character you take here in the tier, they're all insane. They're all account defining characters. So please, I encourage you, if you're serious about PvP, take one of these three characters first. Next up, we have the incredibly important tier, and as the name suggests, that everyone in this tier is very, very important for you to have. After the must-haves, these are the next best characters to choose. Abyssal Euphine is up first here. Her passive Inner Abyss is incredible, as it shuts down a lot of aggressive strategies that are built around pushing up combat readiness. She has a 50% combat readiness reduction with this passive. It's very similar to Red Politis, who is an evergreen character that has stood the test of time for like four years almost five years at this point so i don't expect abyssal to go anywhere either because of this passive the character is also just really really consistent right she's reasonably hard to kill thanks to the fact that she is a defense scaler and if you actually tried to kill her well then you're most likely going to fill up her fighting spirit which triggers her ultimate which is where all of her carry potential comes from you may notice that abyssal euphine is an incredibly important but Navy Captain Landy is in the tier below at commonly used. These two characters are often compared to each other, but I value, in my opinion, Abyssal to be a much better character, a much higher rated character. And that is because, again, of this passive and the consistency at which she performs as a DPS. Landy's pretty scattershot. She's either the most insane broken character ever, or she does nothing. At least with Abyssal, I get some level of consistency and a character like her is really important versus certain cleave compositions. Without her or Red Politis, if they take one or the other's banned or something, you're going to need it because there's very few, if any, other characters that get you out of those scenarios. Next up, we have Bellion. Her passive Shackles of Suppression is pretty evergreen. I don't think this one will either ever go out of style. Stopping your opponents from getting souls will always be very good. And she's consistently one of the highest win rate characters in Epic 7. 
specifically in the matchup she's good at, which is against Cleave and other aggressive strategies that are trying to abuse souls, namely from the Mage Artifact Ancient Book. She's also an incredibly flexible character in terms of how you can build her. You can go Injury, so that, that way she's good versus Bruisers. Counter set with Elbrus or 3F as a hard carry DPS. You can go Protection set with Arius in order to make her a dedicated tank versus Cleave. And you can also make her go super fast with a bunch of effectiveness to control the entire enemy team with her S3 Apocalypse. She's just a very flexible, very fun character, and she's one of my favorites to play in the entire game. The next character to talk about is designer Lilibet, and she might actually be the strongest character in this entire tier, but I didn't want to move her up to must-haves because, well, it's only been a couple of days since the patch went live. It's simply too early to tell as of the recording of this video. Currently, as I'm recording this video, designer Lilibet is the highest win rate hero on the Epic 7 World Arena ladder. She also had a massive showing this weekend at the Zodiac Cup tournament. She has a positive win rate, and it's a pretty high positive win rate, against heroes like Ambitious Tywin, Death Dealer Ray, and the newly buffed Silverblade Arminta. These are things that very few heroes can lay claim to. Her skill 3 model disqualification is a team cleanse, and does amazing damage now thanks to the penetration in the kit. Her passive emergency stitching makes it hard for opponents to stop her from doing her job, and gives her amazing tempo versus control. On top of that, her basic attack skill is now a defense break, and well, as we talked about with the Ambitious Tywin, defense break, that gives you a lot of tempo, and that's the kind of stuff that wins games. Again, this is probably the winner of the patch, and if you have all of the must-haves, I think this is probably going to be the next best option in this entire tier. Next up, let's move on to Eternal Wanderer Ludwig. Ludwig is a staple Cleave character that can clean up an entire team provided you set him up properly with enough copies of Ancient Book on your team. He's not the best Cleave character currently as I'm recording in this video, that's Bloodblade Corinne. But I suspect once people catch on to how good Veronica is post buff, BBK isn't really going to be sitting on the top anymore. Veronica again kind of dismantles her and that's a free unit that everyone has access to. I think Ludwig will make a return to form as the best AoE cleave option, hence why I placed him here. If you're a dedicated cleaver or you want to be a dedicated cleaver, Ludwig is the pick from this tier. Next, we move on to Requiem Rowana. Rowana is currently the strongest bridge in the game for aggressive team compositions. If you have turn one, her passive balance obsession gives her the second turn, and then you use her S3, which lets you strip the enemy team, push back their cooldowns, and lets you kind of smoothly transition or bridge into a snowball that lets you win the game. Do keep in mind that she's not really amazing if you are a dedicated turn two player. And she's actually pretty hard to gear with some very tricky gear requirements. You're going to need like some combination of like six hit pieces or like four hit pieces and some torrent gear. Again, character is not new player friendly in terms of actually gearing her. Next up, we move on to my favorite Soul Weaver in the game in Ruel of Light. She is very powerful because she has a revive in her S3, Light Ascending. It makes it hard for your opponents to use single target bursts in order to win games. And after her changes, you can't really focus her down, right? You could in the past kill her. She has no game pack. That doesn't happen anymore. Now when you kill her the first time she dies, she revives and gets a big combat radius push, which lets her just heal herself up or use the light descending to kind of revive the key character. Damage limit on her S2 means that she's incredible for protecting not only herself, what specific carries or like tanks on your team so that they stay around for a very, very long time. Currently, she feels one like one of the strongest characters in the entire game for Arena and Guild Wars. And in my opinion, she is an amazing safety net for new players and a lot of PvE content. I'm not willing to say that she's the best Soul Weaver in the game yet, but after her changes, she feels very strong and an overall solid pickup. Moving on, we come to my first Moonlight 5 star ever in Epic 7 which is Silverblade Araminta. She is an incredibly strong control carry after the actual changes. Her passive Flame of Sovereign gives so much free damage because one effectiveness equals nine attack now. That's just ludicrous. You get so much free damage now from Flame of Sovereign. You don't even really have to build attack at all, and she will just completely dismantle an entire team. And it also has built-in combat radius push, which means you don't need a ton of speed as well. So you could just focus on like health, defense and effectiveness issue you want and she's probably going to do her job 
for skill three meteor fall is game ending if your opponent has no answer to it it's just a full team stun with a bunch of burns that do good damage thanks to flame of sabra's passive right if you can set it up properly uh they don't have immunity they don't have a cleanser that's game over man she's very easy to build and very effective against nearly anything that doesn't have a cleanser she's super fun super cool if you're looking for a control carry and you already have ambitious tywin this is a pretty good one for you to pick up next we have sylvan sage vivian who is the hottest looking girl in the game you cannot convince me otherwise luna is probably the only other one that will will say is up there as well anyways strong aoe damage dealer who is immune to debuffs that's pretty much the name of the game with this character you can play her on lifesteal with like ancient book or you can play her on destruction with torrent as a two-piece offset with chatty as an artifact to give her some protection not much else to say hits hard solid in a format that's filled with a lot of bullshit debuffs and finally to round out the here we have zeo he nearly guarantees you the first turn with his passive which obviously means he's going to almost always have some kind of value in pvp you can hold book with him to make him kind of do aggressive or cleave comps if you so choose and if you are a turn two player he actually is a pretty decent bruiser i know a lot of people say that he's only good for turn one or aggressive or cleave uh, players out there but i've been playing him for like almost two years at this point and he's been really good for me as a bruiser so even if you're a turn two player if you're looking for something that helps bridge the gap and you don't have like harsetti a reasonably fast CO can let you kind of flip the script on your opponent if they are trying to go fast they leave the character open and it's not banned you could just take it and take all the momentum back from them in a match it's very important to also note i did talk about harsetti there for a second this is one of the only characters that will let you cut in front of harsetti and allow you to take an advantage back from her so as long as harsetti is going to be a relevant meta character zeo is on the short list of really really good characters to fight her which means that he's going to again have inherent value next up we move on to the commonly used units these are units that are used like once every like two or three games i'm going to go a little bit faster in this tier and then obviously speed up with each other tier in order to keep the length of the video down next up we have arbiter vildred descending blade goes burr that's basically it after his exclusive equipment he just hits really really hard his skill three can just wipe an entire team off the face of the earth because of just how much damage it does now so if you just need an aoe damage dealer he's a pretty good one to pick up and he's also very very good in particular against a lot of aggressive glass cannon team compositions next up we have blood moon haste Blood Moon Haste is an anchor who can kill a unit and revive his whole team with his skill 3 Moon Slash if someone besides him dies first on the team before him. He also heals like crazy every time he gets a counterattack if he's on the artifact Celestine. The reason that Haste is here though and not in the tier above is that there's actually an insane amount of things in the format that he loses to right now. New Moon Luna, Hera, Death Dealer Ray, Urban Shadow Shu. Uh, Harsetti, and even the next character we're going to talk about, Briar with Chaseria, can kind of have a pretty good time against him. The character is not bad, it's just he doesn't feel broken like he did a couple months ago because there's just so many damn answers in the pool. You'll find it a lot harder to use him now than he was back over the summer. Next up, we have Briar with Chaseria, who does two things. She strips all of the buffs on the entire enemy team and defense breaks them, and this translates into a aggressive setup that you can use to kind of snowball a game and kill everybody. And then number two, she stops both players from reviving characters. So you take her if you need the aggressive setup or you just are tired of losing to revive characters in PvP. Next, we have Conqueror Lilius. Lilius is a Swiss Army Knife unit that can do a lot of powerful things, although none of them are really broken when compared to the top tiers that are in this day and age. Her skill 3 for honor strips buffs from the enemy team and reduces their offense while increasing the attack and defense of your own team. Her skill 2 cover gives her a solid amount of control as well as team protection with a barrier and her basic attack skill kneel down lets her combo with heroes like Abyssal Euphine and Navy Captain Landy in order to charge up their ultimate faster. Lilius has a lot of counters nowadays which makes it hard for you to dominate with her like she did in the past. That said, I still think she's one of the best overall characters in the game. If you're somebody that likes to play PvE specifically, 
She is amazing in a lot of PvE game modes, namely Abyss and even Hall of Trials, should we ever actually go back to the old style of Hall of Trials and not this new updated one we've been in for like the last like month and a half. Next we have Dragon King Sharoon. She's kind of a soft counter to characters with stuns and sleeps in their kit, basically designed to beat Ambitious Tywin and Death Deal Array with her passive, right? You basically get slept or stunned, and then her passive triggers and they snap out of it, and she gives your team a team damage boost with her passive Cascade. She has very flexible amounts of playstyles. You could play her kind of slow and tanky with a healing artifact because she's a soul weaver, or you could play her very fast with a lot of effectiveness and use her skill three to kind of like wipe all of the buffs off the enemy team, defense break the tanks and soul weavers, and translate that into an aggressive kill. Sadly, she's just not the most reliable answer. She's supposed to stop Death Deal Array and Ambitious Tyrant, but teams that they're on, they can just kind of focus her down and kill her. And if she gets hit with unbuffable, it kind of nearly invalidates her entire passive and her entire team role. She's still a great pickup though, if you need an answer, Tywin and Rey, because she's one of the few ones that there actually are in this game. Next, we have Mediator Quirk, who, like Conqueror Lilius, is a Swiss Army Knife unit that's just not as good as they used to be. Don't get me wrong, Quirk is still one of the best cleansers of the game, and he still has other great utilities with his S2 that can strip buffs, and he has really good damage to boot. The biggest problems with him is that he's not really good versus aggressive team compositions, and he's also pretty bad against the characters that can kind of push his cooldowns back, which if you haven't noticed is a lot of the characters that are in this tier and the tier above him, right? Still, if you need another cleanser and you already have designer Lilibet, I do think he is a pretty good pickup, especially if you care about Guild Wars. Next, we have Landy Uzumaki, who is often compared to Abyssal Yufine. I already mentioned that I think Abyssal is a bit better because of the fact that she's more consistent, but uh, as I call her, Landy Uzumaki, she's got that anime plot armor, that main character privilege. If she gets lucky and gets a lot of counterattacks, nothing in the game is beating her. She just wins for free on the spot. If she doesn't get lucky and doesn't counter, well, then she doesn't do anything. She's truly, in my opinion, a brain dead RNG unit, right? Again, like I said, plot armor incarnate. That said, really, really strong PvE unit. So if you care about PvE at all, like Abyss or like Hall of Trials or any of those things, amazing unit there. And finally, to round out this category, we have Urban Shadow Shoe, who is the injury unit in the format. If you're struggling versus bruisers and tanks like Dragonbride Senya or Empyrean Illinav, then Shu is going to be your girl. She's incredible in those matchups. The only reason that she's not in the incredibly important tier is because, well, she's really bad versus debuffs. And if you build her with a bunch of effect resistance to kind of mitigate her weakness, then she's not super good at her job, right? So again, we have a really great injured character that is just not good versus debuffers. And if in case you haven't noticed, all three of the characters and must-haves are debuffers, and a lot of the other characters that we've talked about in the other tiers and this tier, they're also debuffers. So that's kind of why she lands here. Still, she is really, really strong and probably one of my favorites, if not my favorite character in this entire tier. Moving on to sometimes use. Again, these are characters that are like, you know, kind of fringe, right? You'll see them every once in a while, but they're not like super, super niche like the one-trick ponies. First up, we have my favorite Epic 7 character in the game in Lionheart Sermia. Lionheart Sermia is a powerful AoE DPS that is designed to punish opponents if they use counter attacks, extra attacks, or dual attacks. You get to use her skill 3, I am the victor, whenever they proc a, one of those aforementioned attacks, and that is going to just do big damage and hopefully try to clean up the entire team. Or at least that's how it worked in the past, right? Now, we are in a format where there are characters like Blood Moon Haste, Dragon Bride Senya, or Empyrean Illinav. Illinav just kind of completely cuts your damage in half or less in most cases, so you're just not going to get a huge amount of damage out of Sermia, and she has arguably the worst warrior stat line in the entire game in terms of surviving, so you have a very, you know, squishy character relative to other warriors who can't kill things through Illinav, and then even characters like Senya or Haste, like I mentioned, you won't be able to kill the Senya or Haste, but you might kill somebody else, 
which will trigger their passives and then they'll just turn around and kill you. So the thing is, most of the time when you are fighting things that, you know, Sir Sermia should be good against, they're accompanied with things that actually make it so that Sermia is a detriment to your team, which is why she lands here. It's not that the character's kit is bad, it's just that the things that are being used punish her so hard that you only really get to use her when you're not against those kinds of things, like I said, like a Senya, a Haste, or an Illina, which those three probably show up like every single game if you're against a slower player. Next up, we have Last Rider Crow. Last Rider Crow fell out of favor because his matchup versus Death Dealer Ray is pretty atrocious, and his matchup versus a lot of single target nukes is pretty atrocious, and also Urban Shadow Shoe, also pretty atrocious. That said, he did just get uh, one change that makes him really good against the character Naqual. So if you're playing against Naqual, he's really good now into that character. And also, traditionally, he has had an amazing matchup against Ambitious Tywin. So pretty much he's the tank to play into Ambitious Tywin and into Naqual. And those characters see play almost every game. So that's why he is this high. Otherwise, he would probably be down in one trick pony or can't recommend. Next, we have here Lone Crescent Bologna. Lone Crescent Bologna is kind of like a reactive AoE DPS. She has big single target damage on her turns that ignores critical hit resistance. And she has this passive that makes her kind of do a bat back of AoE damage. She would be better if not for the fact that C Phantom Politis and Death Dealer Ray just have incredible matchups against her. So that's why she lands here. But what she's really good against is these AoE DPSs that are going to trigger her frequently, specifically Navy Captain Landy. Navy Captain Landy is pretty much just absolutely terrible versus Bologna. Like, Bologna feels like she was designed to beat Landy, even though Lone Crest of Bologna came out first. So, yeah. If you're playing against Landy and your opponent doesn't have Sea Phantom, this is pretty much like the best overall damage dealer, I think, against that character. And again, if your opponent is playing a lot of AoE compositions, then this character is also going to be incredible. But outside of those scenarios, cannot really recommend. Next up, we have Maid Chloe. Maid Chloe is like a hybrid cleanser plus reviver. That's kind of like her whole niche. The thing is, other characters are better at cleansing than her. And VIP treatment, which while being a really good revive skill that also gives your team attack buff, I don't think it's as good as Ruel currently is, or even like Blood Moon Haste currently is. So she's not as good of a reviver as those things. And again, not as good of a cleanser as some of the other cleansers out there. Her niche, the thing that really makes her stand out, is that her passive gives extra effect resistance to the team. And also she can wear Shimadra's staff as an artifact, which gives her bonus healing to shore up one of her weaknesses, which is her low healing. And that also gives more ER to the team. And most knights in the game have a team imprint that gives ER to the team. So you can build your account in such a way that everybody has high effect resistance and all of their imprints and all of the passives and artifacts on Maid Chloe can synergize in such a way that you can get a ton of effect resistance on the team. I think if you want to be a gamer that plays turn two with a lot of effect resistance characters, like maybe Christy is a character that you like, then Maid Chloe is absolutely worth a pickup. Just know you're probably going to have to invest a lot in her and build your entire account around her to get the most out of the character. Next up, we have Sage Ball and Saison. Basically, how this character works is they get combat readiness at the end of each of your opponent's turns, and they have a strip and a sleep with their skill too. So you build the character very fast, so that, that way he can interrupt and disrupt a lot of these aggressive cleave strategies. You have to build him on high effect resistance, so that, that way characters like Zeo cannot push him back and silence him, and that way he's still able to do his job. He is essentially a pocket pick versus, again, these cleave and aggressive compositions for you to disrupt them and try to secure the victory that way. Next, we have Solitary of the Snow, who is a powerful AoE debuffer, who's very easy to punish, surprisingly, with characters like Rowana, Lionheart, Sermia, Last Rider, Crow, and others. So she's a very risky pick, but her defining feature is her passive skill, because it completely turns off focus as a mechanic. And as of the recording of this video, Afternoon Soak Flan is absolutely giga top tier, like god tier character, like probably the best DPS in the entire game. And that's 
pretty much one of the best counters to her is Solitaire. Because if they don't have focus because of Solitaire's passive, then you don't have to deal with all of the dual attack shenanigans and the big burst damage that she actually has. So that is the inherent value of Solitaria and why she's in some tiny disease. It's literally because she just counters focus units like Sylvan Sage Vivian and Afternoon Soak Flan. If you're not playing against those characters, she is inconsistent and incredibly risky, and I could not recommend playing her into, again, anything other than those matchups. And finally, to round out this tier, we have Specimen Says. Specimen Says is like a more aggressive, slanted version of Savior Auden. His whole thing is that his S3 Lightstorm is a powerful single target nuke that penetrates 100% of the target's defense if the target is stunned. He recently got an exclusive equipment that also makes it so that penetration extends to slept opponents as well, meaning he has incredible synergy now with Ambitious Tywin as well as Death Dealer Ray, right? So if you can set up a draft that has both Ray and Tywin, then Specimen Says is like the, the best possible DPS, right? Just know that again, you need to build a whole team around him, which is why he's in sometimes used because you have to get all of the pieces together in one draft to make says actually worth it and then pray he doesn't get banned. And if you commit to him in the third pick ban protection slot, well, he's an evasion unit with, you know, very low defense. So he can get picked off by a slew of anti-evasion answers that exist for most other characters, which is why you see characters like Remnant Violet under can't recommend because they're easy to pick off and they don't have the powerful niche and team building synergies that a character like Specimen says has. And finally, we come to One Trick Pony. I don't think I have to explain the characters in Impossible to Gear Cleave units, as I mentioned in the intro. These are characters that just require, like, legend-level whale-tier gear in order to be successful with. And even then, you know, that gear might be better suited to other characters, like your Sea Phantom Politices, your Rans, your Peyras. And there's not really a reason for me to describe the Can't Recommend characters, because, well... They're not good, and I don't recommend taking them unless they're one of your favorites, in which case, anything I say was well, going to influence you anyways. So let's quickly run down the rest of the characters in this tier, and I'll tell you the one scenario where they're pretty good. First up is Apocalypse Ravi. Urban Shadow Shoe and Death Dealer Ray completely block her out of the format, make her just absolutely garbage. But where she is good is versus Harseti, because Harseti will make it so that the game is in such a way that everything is just a bunch of slow, bulky bruisers. And that's like the one spot where Apocalypse Ravi is still good. She's very good versus other health scaling bruisers. So if you see your opponent is going all base speed, Harseti, a lot of bruisers, I like to have a pocket pick, like super tanky base speed Apocalypse Ravi with big damage in order to kind of nullify and win those matchups for me. Next up is Commander Pavel. He's like an okay AoE DPS for Cleave, but honestly, I think there's a lot of better options now. You still could Cleave with him, but again, better options. What makes him really good, though, is he is incredibly good at farming adventure, right? Like Unrecorded History or like uh, Eulogy for a Saint, if you're farming that. He's incredible there. And I know what you're thinking. You're actually advocating for using an ML5 headhunt on adventure. Not really, no, but like, if you have everybody else above him, he's really good at farming gold, and that's why he's here and not under can't recommend, because I can make like 40 million gold in a couple of hours with him, which is incredible, and that's worth something to me. Next up, we have Dark Corvus. He's just good in Guild Wars, right? I don't even think that arena teams are particularly friendly to Dark Corvus. Every once in a while, there is a Guild War defense that Dark Corvus just wins for free against. And in those scenarios, you're happy to have him. Next up, we have Little Queen Charlotte, who is really hard, if not impossible, to use on the slow build. So if you build her as kind of like a fast, aggressive character or like cleave character, she could kind of come out of nowhere, use her skill three, kill a dark unit, and extinct them. That's pretty much it. Next up is Martial Artist Ken, who I think is like only good in like arena offense right now. Um, maybe Guild War offense, that's about it. I don't really think he's playable at all in the current state of World Arena. You pick him into certain defenses that are like all light units and just hit quick battle on arena and get your conquest points. That's kind of it. It's like Commander Pavel, like Commander Pavel farms gold and 
you know, Ken here just farms Mystic Metals and Conquest Points. That's that's kind of all he really does. Next up is Spectre Tenebria. Um, her best role right now is in PvE. She's still one of the best uh, PvE characters of all time. So, not going to discredit her on that. But most people took her with their original Moonlight Blessing. So, if you're a new player, you probably have already taken her. Incredible PvE character. But for PvP, I think her only real like use case is like when your opponent's all single target damage and you are just like super tanky and they can't get to her and you could just win the game that way especially like versus like harseti you could build like base speed lifesteal uh and if their only aoe damage dealer is harseti herself she kind of takes over that game and wins but that's pretty much it no other real time you're gonna be playing her next up is uh spirit eye selene sometimes there's like a guild war defense that can't possibly kill her and you can kind of cheese it and win the game that way otherwise like if your opponent has just nothing that can deal with spirit eyes selene they have no answer to her you can last pick her and if they don't ban her then it's a win but she's just like super niche overall and then finally we have straze who's like the best hunt character in the game but he's incredibly hard to gear for new players so like only like super veterans can really take advantage of that and outside of that, he doesn't really do anything. He's amazing if you want to farm hunts in like 20 seconds. Like, no lie, I farm Banshee in like 23 seconds with this character. But other than that, he doesn't really do anything. And that's going to do it for the Headhunt Recruitment tier list. If you have any more questions, feel free to ask them down in the comment section below. If you want to know why, like, I didn't recommend Operator Segret or any of that, sure, I'll answer that down in the comment section below. At the end of the day, this tier list is just my opinion. Please. Please take the character that you think will bring you the most amount of fun, the one that you really want. This is what this event is all about. Don't necessarily chase meta. Chase your wife who chase your husband or whatever brings you the most amount of joy. And as always, enjoy the rest of your day, the rest of your week. And I'll catch you in the next one. Later now.